just to cover a few things. Uh, so we talked a little bit about the Reardon IBC Academy. Uh, we actually, everyone took a certification test and did well. Uh, we, we wanted it that way. We wanted you to consolidate your knowledge and know that you had learned something. Um, and so today, uh, we'll be discussing the metabolic roots of cancer. Um, I'm going to be looking for what I call the tap root of cancer today. Uh, and then we have going on now as we speak uh, two things that you can take advantage of while you're here. One is we are doing mega panels for participants here. Normally, these mega panels, you have to kind of remember who the Reardon Clinic is. And to understand that, you have to understand its tap root. And uh, Olive W. Garvey was a uh, very influential businesswoman here in Wichita and in really the whole of Kansas. And, and the Garvey families have done so much for Kansas. And included in that is really the Reardon Clinic, which originally, when it was first started, was the Olive W. Garvey Center for the Improvement of Human Functioning International Incorporated. A little bit too long. and so. We thought, uh, and she had asked herself after so many other people stepped forward to contribute to the support of the, the Reardon Clinic, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. They stepped forward, and so she said, please take my name off. There are so many other people doing things, you know. So we shortened it at that point to just the Center for the Improvement of Human Functioning, Incorporated International, da da. And that was a little bit long. And so uh, several years back after Dr. Reardon's passing, um, we got the OK, and we thought we would just simplify it down to the Reardon Clinic in honor of Dr. Reardon's efforts. But really, there have been so many people involved in this. But Olive's interest in this uh, stems from a, a, a book by, uh, I think it's George Watson, ironically. Who, uh, but Watson did a book entitled Nutrition and Mental Illness. And she read that book and thought, why are we not measuring nutrient factors in people who are struggling with mental illness? And just at that same time, Dr. Reardon had teamed up with Carl Pfeiffer and was uh, actively pursuing the mental and elemental causes of uh, mental illness, and it was a perfect marriage, so to speak, of two very deep interests. And so uh, Mrs. Garvey had gone to her primary care physician and asked for some nutrient testing. And you know what he said? He said, what's that? And so uh, she proceed, proceeded to look around for someone who she could help start a nutritionally oriented lab. And it turned out Dr. Reardon was that guy and so we started as a laboratory, and out of that has grown the amazing uh, organization of the Reardon Clinic, which has many different facets of laboratory work, clinical work, research, education. And we're trying to even expand that further. Uh, and we'll be talking about tomorrow uh, the Vitamin C Institute in terms of a becoming a kind of hub of vitamin C research because it's it's rapidly growing. The interest in vitamin C is rapidly growing around the world now. And it needs a good, it's got a good scientific foundation. There are some incredible people who I can't even name all of them that uh, we stand upon, sit upon their shoulders. And we want to honor them by continuing the work that we now see is so important as we move into this new era of chronic illness. And that's what I'm going to be talking about here in just a couple minutes. I'm, uh, I'm stalling a little bit here to see if we can get more people in the room, but it looks like you guys are it. And so uh, uh, tomorrow night we'll be having a banquet to, uh, to uh, culminate our efforts in the next, in today and tomorrow, and it'll be a celebration of people who have been willing to put themselves on the line, so to speak, and stand up in favor of this new paradigm of care. And it's, it's tough, because uh, when, you, when you do that, you know, of course, all new ideas 
go through three stages. Uh, this is the Schopenhauer quote. First, it's ridiculed. Then it's violently opposed. And then it is accepted as being self-evident. I don't know quite what stage we're in. I think we're a little bit between the second and third stage, but it's a little hard to know at times. It depends on who you're with. Uh, but in general, I think the, the uh, evolution of nutritional medicine is, is upon us. And we are seeing uh, that there is an integration occurring, integrative medicine. And we're seeing now that the orthomolecular functional medicine uh, ideal is now being realized in our time. And, and that is going to be the theme of my talk in just a minute here. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to say uh, before we get, get started. And so, uh, all right. Uh, for those of you that are just that are just come in, you know we're going to try to stay on time, though we may get a little bit behind this morning, and I will apologize in advance. The three uh, presentations you're going to hear this morning are loaded with information, and I mean loaded. And so uh, I think the the IVC Academy was well thought out. I'm glad we had it because there are some of you that this is somewhat new. And it will give you a good foundation, a good platform on which to build the ideas that you're going to be hearing about this morning. Because that's kind of like 101, and we're going to jump to 304 or 404 or advanced uh, classes here pretty quickly. But the speakers are good enough, and I'm hoping that we will uh, explain ourselves well enough that as you assimilate this new information, it will be a big wow in your mind. At least it, it looks like it to me as I have been reading through uh, what they've sent. So, but in effort to stay on time, my wife is a second grade teacher and when she gives a test, she has this wonderful little time tracker. And when I push this start button, I have 45 minutes, which will be impossible for me to finish my presentation in 45 minutes. But at the end of 45 minutes, it'll start to blink yellow so that I know I've got to finish my ideas as best I can. So I'm going to try to keep on track with this. And so uh, and this is what we'll be using with all the speakers over the course of the presentation. So, so today, this morning, my goal is to give you an overture of what you'll be learning in the course of the next couple days. In serving as a kind of architect of this symposium, my goal was to synthesize it in a way that you could see the grand theme. So this addressing the metabolic roots of cancer is really going to shine through in every presentation. And you will begin to see that every presentation is one piece of a symphonic orchestra. And if we do our job well, by the time we're done, you will be hearing in your mind a kind of symphony of ideas that should be music, not noise. And uh, one of the peculiarities of our time is the fragmentation of knowledge. And interestingly enough, it's not serving us like it used to. Uh, we, we are products of a great revolution that has already occurred in medicine that brought about huge changes in the way medical care was delivered in this country. And this came to my attention when uh, we heard about, uh, there, was a, there was an editorial in the Wichita paper decrying the fact that based upon evidence-based medicine studies of nutrients, it looked like they didn't do anything, like there was no, quote, evidence to support it. And so, in thinking through how that could be, because I'm sure those of you who have worked in the field of nutrition know that there are scads of excellent studies that support the role of not only nutrition, but hormonal therapy, detoxification, uh, exercise, sleep, stress management, all the various components of what we know that it takes to be well, those are all actually very well supported when you go back and look at the overview of what research does exist. But we have become very narrow-minded in modern times, and we want to take one intervention, 
one drug or one intervention treatment, and we want to study it in terms of a large audience. And uh, it's a kind of epidemiological research protocol called evidence-based medicine, which has its benefits. And uh, obviously, it has a lot of proponents. But there are a lot of people that are now questioning evidence-based medicine because it's not systemic. It's fragmentary. It kind of narrows it down to one intervention. And we look at it in a broad population. And it's very easy for everything to kind of pan out as not doing anything. So it kind of supports the notion that was very prominent before the beginning of the other revolution that I'm going to talk about is that there was a sense of nihilism. Nothing really works very well. And I think right now in the general population, as we look at the drug commercials coming on TV, I have a lot of patients coming in saying, I don't know what to do, you know, because the drugs look scary. Uh, the people are saying the nutrients don't work. Uh, I'm trying to do exercise. Am I supposed to eat eggs or not eat eggs? Is butter OK or is it not OK? Uh, so there is a kind of confusion that I think has, quite honestly, disenchanted a lot of people. But it has also motivated our population to look deeper into what does it take to get to the real answers of how I can improve my own health. But to understand where I think we are now, we have to go back one paradigm that shifted things dramatically and changed the face of medicine dramatically. And that is the, uh, the evolution of germ theory. And it was because of germ theory that medicine kind of came out of the dark ages. And we suddenly felt like, hey, we have something that does something for people and it's dramatic, and it saves lives, and it changed the way people thought about doctors and medicine and medical care in a dramatic way. And if you want to see how, this, how powerful this change was, just look at what's going on in the news media now around Ebola. What does Ebola mean to people? Well, I believe there is in our genes or in our psyches, the, the genetic psyche that we all carry with us, a fear of plague. And when you go back and read all the stories about the great influenza, the plague, uh, childbirth fever, and uh, during World War I, when all this, more than half of the soldiers died of infection secondary to their wounds, not the wounds themselves. Infection was a huge uh, bugaboo in the human psyche. And with the advent of germ theory and the evolution of germ theory, and believe me, that was not accepted. That was ridiculed. That was violently opposed. Uh, Jenner, you know, taking cowpox and inoculating kids with a germ. Oh my gosh. You talk about vaccination controversy. It was really big then, and of course we're now back in it again. But uh, so germ theory and the acceptance of germ theory and all it had to go through to be accepted is a prime example of uh, what Dr. Reardon wrote about in his uh, in his books, Medical Mavericks. And I hope all of you get a chance to look through those. Uh, they were his consolation of philosophy book that he wrote because he he really felt like what he was doing was a huge advance in modern medicine but it certainly was violently opposed and often ridiculed but uh, but he did see some acceptance as time was going on but he wrote these books because he needed to reassure himself that every great advance in medicine, was opposed before it was accepted. It, it represented a breaking of the bud, a death of the old paradigm in order to bring in the new paradigm. And so what I'm really hoping to talk about today is how we are into the early stages of the new paradigm that is the next stage beyond the germ theory. It's not that we throw out the germ theory. Uh, evolution is a process of growth upon prior advances. And so I believe that 
uh, without that advance, we wouldn't even be where we are now. And uh, we have extended life. Back in the 1940s, you were expected to live to about age 46 or 47, and now we're 78, 79, though this, they say that this year may be the first year that the life expectancy actually goes down because of trends in uh, chronic illness. And so uh, this is being well documented by a number of organizations. I wanna just shout out to Jeff Bland's organization, Functional Medicine, in, in that, <laughs> I always like to say Jeff, stole Dr. Reardon's idea. He didn't. He's developed a lot of great stuff. But Dr. Reardon, the Center for the Improvement of Human Functioning, the Functional Medicine Conferences. Jeff was a speaker at the second Functional Medicine Conference. Gee, Jeff, where'd you get that idea of functional? I think Dr. Reardon was talking about that way back then. If you will measure something that can be improved and show that it is improved and then show that human life has improved as a result of making that intervention. That's a very powerful new idea that has now being radically accepted in, obviously in this community of people, but around the world we're thinking about what improves human functioning, not just what gets rid of disease. Uh, one of the most powerful things I've learned in my evolution of how to deal with patients is to keep the focus on what you want to create with your patient. When you say we wanna prevent disease or we wanna kill disease or we wanna kill cancer or stop cancer or fight cancer, you're putting the focus on what you don't want. And guess what? Where you focus is what grows. And so the really powerful focus in, in, the, in this movement that we're in now, whatever you wanna call it, functional medicine, integrative medicine, orthomolecular medicine, we're focusing on the result that we want to create for our patients, better health, better quality of life, better longevity and, and stamina and well-being. So these, these are very powerful systemic ways of changing the way medicine functions with patients. And, and it harkens back to some traditional thoughts, you know, the Hippocratic ideal of, of let food be your medicine. Uh, health is the focus of the traditional medicine, such as Ayurvedic and Chinese medicine and traditional healing. So what I see dying now, or at least being incorporated into a bigger paradigm, is the principle of parsimony. Uh, Occam's razor, that if we could just explain things in the simple possible, the most simple way, like one disease, one cause, one treatment. And this is what the, uh, this is what the germ theory gave us. Pneumococcus causing pneumonia treated with penicillin. Um, I was reading uh, the book, um, The Demon Under the Microscope by Thomas Hager, the discovery of sulfa medications. And it came right after World War I when so many soldiers had died and they, they couldn't do anything about it. All the principles of hygiene and whatnot weren't working as these soldiers would get sh dirty shrapnel into their system, it was they would all die of secondary infections. And so the discovery of sulfa was a huge step, and it was a single bullet. It was a silver bullet that actually did work, and it brought about a big change in childbirth fever. Of course, Semmelweis, years earlier, had shown that if you wash your hands in between patients, uh, in between the cadaver lab and the delivery room, you could dramatically reduce childbirth fever from 10% to 1%. But he, of course, not only was he ridiculed, but he was kicked out of his medical society and ended up in an insane asylum. So there are some days, you know. So, uh, so we see this principle of parsimony starting to not necessarily fall apart, but be expanded. If you go to Mayo, what'll happen is you'll go through different departments and the principle of parsimony is working in those isolated departments. Let's see if we can figure out what's wrong with your gut. And we're gonna give you a diagnosis for your gut. And then we're gonna figure out what's wrong with your skin. Go to the Department of Dermatology and here's the cardiologist. And in many ways, it's like trying to just tune separate sections of the orchestra, fix them, without looking at how the whole orchestra together is working to create the harmony of health, the music of well-being, 
the quality of experience that really is what we're after. Certainly, we don't want to be ill, but we now know that health is more than the absence of illness. And so as we look at this concept of cancer now, and this is going to, I'm kind of, hey, I'm going to get into my lecture now. Uh, as we look at the concept of cancer, it was so enlightening for me to read The Emperor of All Maladies, a biography of cancer, Siddhartha Mukherjee. I, I really recommend, it's a big book. It, it won the, I think, the National Book Award, and it's really worth reading to see how we tried so hard, and we're still trying to use that one disease, one treatment, one cause, one treatment idea to fix cancer. And I believe, and the reason I'm bringing this up is I believe this group is a little bit in danger of that. We would like to think, and there are a lot of patients out that are, the, that are thinking that IV vitamin C is the one treatment for the one cause for the, you know, for this uh, thing we call cancer, which we now know there's probably no two cancers that are exactly alike. Of course you can look at lung cancer and you can look at renal cell cancer and whatnot, and they have similar cellular characteristics. But when you look at the individual patient, what you find is that each patient's life is so different. And this is why it's so hard to really study cancer in the way that we, I think, really needs, really needs to be studied. We need to look at the whole lifestyle of, of that patient. What are you eating? What exposures have you had? What's, as Dr. Levy was saying, what's in your mouth? What kind of dental work have you had that might be influencing this cancer? What's your, what's your family life like? Do you, are, you, are you happy? Are you sad? Are you employed? Are you broke? Uh, does your family support you? Are, you? are you at odds with your family? What nutrients are you taking? What diet are, are you on? All of these factors enter into whether or not a patient's going to be successful. So when people call me, and we have a call-in time every Thursday night where people call in to talk to us about what we have to offer at the Reardon Clinic, you know what they always say? And you guys have probably gotten this. How many cases of this type of cancer had you had, and how many of those have you got well with IV vitamin C? And I say, well, yeah, we've, we've had a lot of those kinds of cancers, but you know, each one has been a little bit different, and we've had to investigate in a real doctor way, take a history, do a physical, connect with the patient, learn to walk inside of their shoes. This is what Dr. Reardon taught me. He said, you know, you really need to try to get inside the patient as you're taking your history and understand what dynamics are going on in their life. And then you will be better equ equipped to order your lab test, to set up your protocol, to arrange for your detoxification or whatever modalities you wanna bring to bear on this patient. You need to know what you know as, a, as the doctor, as the physician. You need to know that and you need to know it well. And that's what this symposium is about. But you really have to understand that each unique patient, no matter what their cancer is, has a unique story, a unique illness. And your job is to connect with them and understand some of the dominant themes within that illness. You're the conductor, in a sense, as a co-learner with that patient. Shall we say you're co-conducting the orchestra now of that patient's health and life. And obviously, there's a professionalism there. You know, it's not you don't want to take on the patient's karma, so to speak, but you want to be compassionately detached in a way that you can really begin to see what they can't see. And that's why I think our mission at the Reardon Clinic is to help you, and I'm, when I, when I, with you as the patient. Now, guess what? We're all patients, too. We're doctors, but we're patients. Each one of us are struggling with our own issues, and one of the real gifts of being in this particular career this particular career of, of uh, whatever you call it, functional medicine, lifestyle medicine, we are able to look at ourselves as well because we're patients too. Our mission is to help you create real and lasting health. So again, the focus is on health by identifying, this is our detective work, we identify and then we go about the business of correcting hidden root causes. If the root causes were obvious, no one would need us. But what turns out is that many of these root causes are hidden within the assumptions of what patients come to us with. You know, what patient tells you they're eating a bad, now some patients say I'm eating a bad diet. 
A lot of people say, I'm really, I'm doing the best I can. I'm surprised I got cancer. I've been doing, I've been on vegan, or I've been doing this type of diet. I, why did I get cancer? There's got to be some hidden root causes. So our job is to use our skills and our technology, this new technology that's developing, to identify and correct the hidden root causes of your chronic illness. So that's a very powerful mission that uh, can really change people's lives. And as I mentioned to the group yesterday, one of the most exciting things for me to say to a cancer patient is, and, I, and I'm, I'm kind of building this off of Dr. Abram Hoffer used to ask his schizophrenics, what are you gonna do when you get well? What a great question. Who asks their mentally ill patients, what are you gonna do when you get well? Or Dr. Reardon used to ask his patients, how will you know you're better? You see how that shifts the whole perspective out of, oh, you poor thing, you've got this terrible illness, oh my gosh. What are you gonna do when you get better? How will you know you're, you're well? Uh, so really, the shift here is getting people to think about, and, and okay, and here's, here's Dr. Ron's statement to patients. And I just, I don't even ask a question, I say, if you play your cards right, you're gonna be healthier than you've ever been. This cancer is gonna be one of the best gifts you've ever had. What? Cancer as a gift? Illness as a gift? Well, guess what? Your illness can be your road back to optimal health if you make that kind of mental judo step where you turn the force of the attacker into the energy of your own strength and well-being. And that's what I think we're doing that is so exciting to me. That's why every day I see a patient, I don't come to work, oh gosh, another day, Ugh. It's more like, wow, what am I gonna learn today from this patient? How are we gonna work on things? What revelation is gonna come that's gonna help us do a better job of helping all of our patients identify and correct the root causes of their illness? And that brings us to what this symposium is about. It's about looking at those root causes in an orchestrated way. These are not independent by themselves sort of things. And that's why I've, I've created this little card for all of you. I hope you've all taken a look at it. Look at the green side first because the green side is really what we're trying to do with patients. This is what I call the Reardon Delta. And Delta means what? Change. And so insanity is what? doing things the way you've always done them and expecting something to change. So I tell patients right off the bat, hey, coming here is all about changing, looking at, identifying, and correcting things in your life that are bringing about the illness that you're in. Something has caused your illness, and it's probably not one thing, it's probably several things. And you don't know what it is, I don't know what it is, but we're gonna look together and see if we can find out this is a kind of a map that tells people what are the, the green triangles are what they need to focus on building, correcting, balancing, making stronger. The six yellow downward facing triangles are the things that gets, get us in trouble and that's what we're gonna be talking about in this symposium today. Now I put IVC first in, in the middle there because I really do believe that vitamin C has a kind of immediate corrective capability that can help patients with these six common denominators of chronic illness and why it's such a great way to get started. It's a very powerful metaphor that people are taking vitamin C into their vein and restoring their vigor and their immune function and their adrenal health and they're detoxifying and they're, they're beginning to uh, generate a response that helps them overcome what would otherwise seem to be a lethal enemy in their life. You know, this cancer, so many people die from cancer. I always say more people die from the word than from the disease because they're so afraid and our culture is so tied up into cancer that it, it is such a untreatable illness. I think it's very treatable. I think we can we can very easily convert it into at least a chronic illness that's not terminal, and we can, at, at the very least, for people that are coming in at the 11th hour, improve their quality of life dramatically with IV vitamin C. But is that the only thing they do? Heck no. 
They need to be looking at the whole picture. Now, if you turn the card over, that's the way they present. This is my typical patient. Maybe it's yours, too. All of these yellow, tri this is what they say, doctor, I'm, I don't eat very good. I've been on all kinds of antibiotics and steroids, and I, I've got a lot of indigestion, and my life is kind of a mess right now because we're, we are financially stressed. And, and oh, yes, I've gone through menopause, and I feel lousy. I can't sleep. I've got hot flashes. What are supplements? I, yeah, I, t I take a little, I take a, I take a one a day, and I've got my digestion's messed up, and oh, I feel so depressed and uh, out of sorts, and what am I going to do? And I, and someone said that my teeth are infected. I've got periodontitis, and yeah, I'm really, I, I crave sugar. That's all I really want because I'm so tired. And but the doctor says my thyroid's okay. Thank goodness, you know, I've, he's done the TSH. My thyroid's okay. What toxins? Toxins? I haven't heard anything about toxins. Yeah, I am really tired, but you know, who wouldn't be with this kind of disease? And my CRP's elevated. So that's what we typically see. I've got some green triangles in here because for people even to make it to us, they've got to have some structure in their life. And so they usually have a few good things that's helping them to begin the investigation. So this is we're gonna, what we're going to be talking about today. And this is what I'm starting out with, the metabolic roots of cancer. And uh, this is the triangle that I just had you look at. These are all the elements that need to be orchestrated. Do you do that in one visit to the doctor? No. I oftentimes tell people this is more like gardening than medicine. And that if you want to have a really good garden, you better get your gardening magazine. You better go to the garden store and make friends with the guy that's the expert in gardening. And you better get some really good fertilizers, get your soil checked start hoeing, start weeding, start doing all the things you need to do to have a garden. And then it's probably going to take you two or three seasons of working on your garden. And you're going to need to love your garden. This is not going to, this good, this beautiful garden is not just going to grow itself. You're going to have to work at it. And uh, the, my, my, my favorite of all uh, analogies is from Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And this, I think this really sums it up. He said, uh, people that go to the doctor and expect the, the magic bullet that's going to fix them is like the college student who goofs off all semester, crams the last week before the test, and passes the test. But when he gets out in the real world, he really doesn't know much. Tell that to a farmer who has to biologically think about what he's going to plant, plan for it, actually plow test the soil, get the right fertilizer, put the seeds in, grow the seeds, hope for rain, pray for main, rains, the spiritual dimension, pray for rain, take care of their crop, harvest it, sell it, plan for next year, you know, all the things that a farmer has to do, that's really, farmers are my best patients. They get what we're trying to do at Reardon Clinic. Patients that have been kind of getting by in their lives with quick fixes, they don't get it. They kind of say, well, well, can I just take some vitamin C? Is that it? No, no, that's a good start, but it's not, a, it's not the finish. You've got to use that as part of a whole life revision. And that's what I call treating the metabolic roots of cancer. But the food is really one of the first things. That's why I put this up here first, because without addressing food, you're <laughs> You're in total delusion. You've got to think about what you're eating and how that's affecting your gastrointestinal system and what you need to do to detoxify and improve gastrointestinal health. So that's kind of, if you want a place to start, that's the tip of the spear. Start there. And I have Dr. Mike Bauerschmidt talking to us this afternoon about cancer and nutrition because it's, it's so confusing. You know, what's the right thing to eat? What's the wrong thing to eat? Then we've got to help the patients to detoxify. Uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, uh, Tom Levy's talking about if you're in the shower, you're never going to get dry. You know, you've got to you've got to get out of the shower to dry off. So you've got to deal with the toxic loads that are very real and probably pulling you down. So Dr. Crinion, we're so pleased to have Dr. Crinion here to talk about environmental toxins and complete cancer care. Can't do without it. Dr. Reardon knew about this. I think he had his tree upside down. This was from our, our RECNAC uh, uh, booklet. 
he put the, the cancers down in the roots and the, the causes kind of up in the trees, and I think it's the other way around, but it's still, it's still important. So RECNAC was the very first effort here at the Reardon Clinic uh, to look at what we can do to help cancer patients, novel approaches to cancer. So it was compre comprehensive biological research, and we were looking for non-toxic adjunctive treatment modalities for cancer patients. So really, that's the adjunctive care, the lifestyle care they don't get. And so we don't really need to be enemies with the oncologist. We should be going to our oncologist as in a spirit of friendship and saying, hey, we can make your results better, guys, gals. We can make you have a more successful outcome with your patients. We know you don't have time to address all these lifestyle issues. That's our expertise. We are the experts in the adjunctive care of the pa cancer patient. Come to us, we'll work with you. There's no reason in the world, I, in my mind, and this is something else that Dr. Reardon taught me. He said, you know, most doctors, if not all, I'll just say most, are really out there to help their patient with the best they know with the training they have. And if you assume otherwise, you're really making, I think, a false assumption. I think people are doing the best they can with what they know. Now, not everyone knows about this new paradigm of care. And so with any new paradigm, uh, it takes time. And especially in the field of medicine, because doctors are pretty darn conservative as a bunch. That's why it took over 70 years for the germ theory to be accepted. The germ theory of all things. You'd think, okay, everyone would just hop on that bag. Wait. No, it was violently opposed. So vitamins, these kinds of nutritional th therapies, bio bioidentical hormones, all these things, detoxification, these are pretty new things. We're on the cutting edge of this stuff, and we're wondering why is it taking so long for doctors to get this? Well, first of all, it's part of it's the payment system, part of it's the training, part of it is just the inertia of, of ideas. And, and when a doctor's been practicing a certain way for a long time, they're not about to make a sudden change. It's, it's amazing that you're in this room. You know, you are free-thinking free people to even be here and, and to be discussing this. So Dr. Gonzalez and Miranda are here. They have been, ama they have been our uh, RECNAC2. They, and they have, I, I think Dr. Reardon, if he were here, he would give them a huge hug. He was a big hugger because they have really carried on the work of RECNAC so well and now they've got some, they've published a new book, and they're gonna be talking about variables that impact the clinical effectiveness of IVC. That's, hey, guess what? That's your metabolic root causes, the variables that impact the clinical effectiveness of vitamin C. IVC by itself is great, but Dr. Hopper, who's here today, will tell you that just if you just give cancer patients IVC alone and don't really deal with these metabolic cofactors, root causes, IVC alone will not, cure cancer. Okay, got it? Everyone understand that? I, at least that's my opinion. Now, maybe there are some people you can just load them up with vitamin C, but I don't think so. I think you have to really look at the whole person and really work hard to get cancer looking better. Now, IVC, having said that, oh my gosh, it's so powerful. It corrects scurvy. It supports detoxification. It relieves pain and promotes well-being. It boosts cellular immunity, preventing secondary infections stimulates co collagen formation to wall off the tumor, inhibits hyaluronidase to retard metastasis, relieves cellular hypoxia. This is big. We're gonna be talking about this in just a second. Restores aerobic metabolism. This may be one of the tap roots of cancer. Restores mitochondrial functioning, improves apoptosis. You can't have apoptosis without mitochondrial functioning. It inhibits angiogenesis. Uh, uh, Dr. Nina, uh, Neil Reardon, tremendous work in this field of, of inhibiting angiogenesis, and it reduces tumor nutrient supply, potentiates chemotherapy and radiation, and reduces the side effects of conventional therapy. It is a very plausible oncologic adjunct in cancer patient care. That line, in my mind, sums it all up. It's a very plausible oncologic adjunct in cancer patient care. That should not get anyone in trouble that should, we should be thinking, hey, this is our, our flag that we can fly high and with pride that we can do something for these patients to help them live longer, live better, and very likely get over their cancer. 
You can get our protocol. It's online. It's in your. It's it's uh, all, for those of you that are just coming in. You you've got the syllabus on your USB drive on your uh, your name tag. So it's there for any patient to download. This is the fourth rendition, and we added the word adjunctive because we want to align ourselves with all the people who are working with cancer patients. In many cases, cancer patients need everyone working together to help them overcome their illness. I want to just give a shout out to Dr. Nina, Dr. Neil. These two were so instrumental in advancing the rear and IVC protocol. And so if you get to see them today, shake their hand or give them a big hug because they have been tremendous. Um, I'm very pleased to have the naturopaths here. The naturopathic, I always tell people, if I would have known what I know now, I would have probably gone to naturopathic school because I really think they understand in an integrated way what we're talking about here. That is the essence of naturopathic medicine. And we have several of them here today that's going to be presenting. I'm really looking forward to uh, all of their presentations. Dr. Tom Levy, so for those of you that were here yesterday or for those of you that have heard Tom speak, I need say no more. Uh, as, he's, as he's told me in the car last night on the way back to the hotel from the pyramid party, get ready to have your mouth drop open. He'll be uh, third this morning. Poor oxygen utilization. This may, in my mind, may be one of the core issues of cancer because every cancer patient I see, they're tired, they're fatigued, they're wasting, their life is wasting, their, their muscles are wasting. They just barely can get out of bed. They, they have no stamina, no will, and they're trying to get better, but they, they lack the energy to get better. And it, hey, health is all about energy and enthusiasm. This was Dr. Reardon's famous definition. Health is having the, the inner, let's see, the res, let's see. Health is having the reserve to do what you need to do and want to do with energy and enthusiasm. So without oxygen, you're not gonna have very much energy. You need oxygen getting to the cells. And so this is a core issue. Uh, which comes first, decreased oxygen utilization or premature aging? I don't know. I think they come together. Uh, Dr. Schallenberger, who's going to be here, is going to talk to you about his research. And he does, he does a, uh, a kind of a little bicycle treadmill test where he measures CO2 consumption as people exercise. And he can document mitochondrial dysfunction in all of his chronically ill patients, but in all of his cancer patients. So if you've got a slow metabolic idle, if your lawnmower is, and I, and I, I always, I, at first I was embarrassed to do this, because I say, I'm telling people, you know, your, your idle on your lawnmower is throttled down too low, and your lawnmower sounds like this, do 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 and patients say, that's how I feel. And I say, yeah, what we want to do is do, 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 do. we want to get your lawn more going again so you can mow that heavy grass. And we probably need to clean out the grass that's built up. And I, I actually was trying to get my lawn more started this, this uh, summer, and it wouldn't start. And I thought, well, what do I do? Well, look at the instruction book. And it said, have you changed the air filter? And so I unscrew the, and it's just all clogged up. I could have put the best gas in that lawn more. I could have turned the throttle way up, but it was all clogged up. And until I put the new air filter in, the lawnmower was not going to work better. And, and once I put that filter in, man, it was working great. So, uh, so Dr. Schallenberger is going to be talking about oxygen, mitochondria, ATP. Now, I think Dr. Schallenberger is going to be talking about this. I'll believe it when I see the whites of his eyes. So would all of you please, how many of you have been to previous conferences here? Oh, yeah. Give him a little tap on the shoulder. Say, hey, great to see you, Dr. Schellenberger. He's kind of opted out on me a couple times. So he says, I talked to him on the phone. We did have to change the schedule for me this time, too, but we did. And he'll be here tomorrow morning. But I think it's great because he is really a forward thinker, and I, I love his, his book. And um, this is a great book on ozone therapy, but it really is more than that. It tells you about mitochondrial functioning and how that plays a role in cancer care, and he'll go into this uh, this fundamental uh, 
uh, Krebs cycle stuff. It's really important. He believes that early onset mitochondrial dysfunction is rampant. I think he's right. You know, I, uh, I, have, I no longer call fibromyalgia fibromyalgia. To me, it's the dysregulation syndrome, and I'll show you why in just a few minutes. But his triangles match up very well with the ones that I had put together. If you look, if you look on the back side of this and turn, well, you, don't have, you can't turn it upside down, but his triangles, if you read his book, he says these all contribute to what? Oxygen disutilization early onset mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, as I tell people, you are not sick, you are dysregulated, and we want to re-regulate you. Your orchestra's out of tune. Your air filter's clogged. We need to kind of work on these things, and then we can start hearing the more, sound better, you can start mowing again, you'll have music in your life, but you have to work at finding and correcting what these things are. So they match up pretty closely. So is oxygen the bottom line? Maybe. Here's some of my questions that I hope will get answered in this symposium. What is the principal action of IV vitamin C? And there's some interesting correlations between IV vitamin C and ozone therapy. Is early onset mitochondrial dysfunction the core root cause of cancer? Maybe, but you know, even it's caused by other things too. Will cancer yield to the correction of early onset mitochondrial dysfunction. I think it will, at least to, to some degree. Will cancer always be multifactorial illness? My answer would be yes. It is the consummate, it is the emperor of multifactorial illness. Must all the root causes of cancer be corrected before true healing can occur? Well, you know what? I think we spend our whole lives working on all of the root causes of any illness. We are never done, that's why we tell patients Okay, we've got you into remission now, but you've got to stay in remission. How many people have gotten into remission? They creep back into their old bad habits, and oh gosh, it's back again now. It probably never completely left. Is it best to refer to IVC as an adjunctive therapy in the care of cancer patients? I believe so. I believe that's a humble way of getting everyone interested in IVC. I believe IVC should be a part of every oncologic therapy session, really. Uh, if cancer is an annual mutation, will we ever find a cure for cancer? I'm not going to go into that, but that's a very interesting side question that may or may not come in the, up in the course of this particular conference. So Dr. Reardon's great wisdom is we don't treat cancer here. We treat patients who have cancer. He was the personification of personalized medicine. He literally would put himself in the shoes of his patients in an effort to use his knowledge and his experience to find out and identify what were the root cause in that person's illness. Because as you know, you can think you understand cancer and then next patient walks in the door and you realize how dumb you really are. And that's why you have to have this therapeutic alliance with your patients in order to really get to the root causes. So in conventional medicine, we treat the disease, we grade the tumor, stage it, kill, try to kill the cancer cells, we create more oxidative stress, and we're trying, the goal of therapy, the way we judge whether or not we've helped is the quantity of survival. Patients will live three weeks longer, and we say that therapy was successful. Now, their three weeks longer was not necessarily great quality of life. It may, they may have been miserable, but, but they lived three weeks longer, by golly. So uh, at the Reardon Clinic, and I'm not saying this is the only way, but since it's our conference, I'm gonna say this is the way we do it, is that we care for the patient. We, we search for the underlying causes. We tr attempt to correct those. We strengthen the healthy cells. We lessen oxidative stress, and we're working very hard to improve quality of life and health. But look at all these factors. This, to me, is why it's so hard to, when patients say, how many of this, how many lung cancer patients have you had? Well, I've had about 100 different lung cancer patients, and this is, why? Because they all have these different oxidative factors, and they all create extracellular oxidative stress. Antioxidants do help. Uh, there, 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 are, there are oncologists that are afraid of patients taking antioxidants because it's going to nullify their, their, uh, their pro-oxidant chemotherapy. But in reality, the research has been pretty clear, Charles Simone, 
has done a lot to show that there are good studies supporting the use of antioxidants in patients. That's why we ask patients to eat fruits and vegetables. Colors are great phytonutrients, and they show increased survival. And there are many published benefits uh, in terms of correcting nutritional deficiencies, interrupting the cell cycle of cancer cells, inducing apoptosis, reducing side effects of chemotherapy, controlling inflammation, inhibiting free radical production, easing pain, improving appetite, and often extending life expectancy. And I think IV vitamin C does all this in its lower doses. And yesterday we talked a lot about how if you get up to about 25 grams of vitamin C a day, depending upon how fast you give it, you're exerting an antioxidant effect upon the patient, which can greatly improve how they feel and improve their quality of life. We're looking now at the higher doses of vitamin C for that, that what I call the paradoxical bioxidant effect of high-dose vitamin C. It's, it's an antioxidant and a prooxidant. So there's a lot of research supporting antioxidants, and a vitamin C is an antioxidant, of course, it, and it will always be an antioxidant. But this is where it gets interesting, and for those of you who have not heard this, some of this will be a little bit repetitious, but I think it's worth repeating. What's going on inside the cell, and what are we doing for the cancer patient inside their cells? Because that's where we really want to go with the prooxidant effect. And so uh, what I hadn't thought about, and this is where I have to give some credit to Dr. Schallenberger, what's going on with those intracellular antioxidant enzymes? Sure, we can load patients up with antioxidant supplements and better diet, but you know, those patients can progress too. So what about, are we missing out on the intracellular oxidative stress? And so it turns out that a healthy intracellular milieu has a slightly redu reducing environment, and, and you can look at the reasons for that, oxygen and adequate ATP and intracellular wa water quality, that's very interesting, water quality, nutritional microenvironment, antioxidant enzymes, and healthy lifestyle choices. But we're, that's always competing with the outside world. The outside environment is, shall we say, hostile, and the cell is always trying to maintain an inner homeostatic balance that helps negate the oxidizing uh, aspects of the, well, this is the oxidizing aspects of the intracellular milieu. You, we forget about that, that the mitochondria is spewing off all kinds of reactive oxygen species. And so, uh, so, so I gotta hurry here. Um, what time do we have? We're good, we're good. I got, I'm gonna go about 20 minutes here, and since I'm the MC, I can go a little longer. So, <laughs> because really the, the, the good part's coming. Uh, so, so these are the things that can cause oxidation, and these are part of the, the toxins and the lack of nutrients and the unhealthy lifestyle. That's what disbalances that internal milieu, and you have intracellular stress, intracellular reactive oxygen species, uh, intracellular sickness, shall we say, the sick cell syndrome. And so, what I hadn't thought about is that oxygen itself can induce antioxidants inside the cell. So it's not what you take in, it's what you utilize. And this is, this is Dr. Schallenberger's question, what's the difference between a 20-year-old and a 70-year-old, which is, this is a major, you know, being elderly is a major cancer risk. Well, it's decreased oxygen utilization. So oxidative stress is not only caused by a deficiency of antioxidant nutrients. You can take those and that will kind of help you get by, but what you'd really like to do is to manufacture your own antioxidant enzymes. And so uh, if you are in a state of functional hypoxia, however, as defined by Levine and Kidd in their wonderful book uh, on antioxidants, you're gonna be in a vicious cycle where you're not making enough uh, conversion of NADH to NAD, you're decreasing your ATP, and without ATP, you cannot produce antioxidant enzymes. That increases your risk of mitochondrial injury and stress. Your cells begin to shift anaerobic. You have decreased CO2 output, so you have poor oxygen exchange from the hemoglobin. You're, and without adequate mitochondrial dysfunction, your P53 can't work properly. You know, the P53 
is the apoptosis gene that tells the cancer cell to commit hairy carry. It puts the knife in the belly and opens up the re reactive oxygen species in the mitochondria to kill the, the, the injured cell. But, but if your mitochondria aren't working, there's no reactive oxygen species there. It's the cells have gone glycolytic, and so the cell cannot apoptose, and so it can turn cancerous at that point. So the question is, what does IV vitamin C do to help this out? And we'll come back to that. So this is all faulty oxygen transportation, not gonna go into that. But the big thing is, in cancer, the cells shift to glycolytic metabolism, where they're only making two ATPs per molecule of glucose instead of the 36 more that they should be making if they had normal mitochondrial functioning. So the cells become energy deficient, and without energy, it doesn't matter, the, cell, the complex machinery that normally maintains cellular health, it has no energy. It's, it's, it's in recession. It's, it's a, it's a, the economy of the cell is, is, is deficient. So the cells to survive shift to glycolytic fermentative metabolism. They're anaerobic, just like Otto Warburg found in the 1920s. Cancer cells are anaerobic. They are anaerobic obligates. They're trying to survive. I, I, some, I had one group of scientists at the Reardon Clinic years ago who said it's like putting a healthy kid in a bad neighborhood and he becomes psychopathic in order to survive among all the hoodlums. The cancer is depleted of nutrient reserves and you develop cachexia and inefficient use of glucose. And that's why on the PET scan you give uh, radioactive glucose and these cells are just gulping up glucose because they're trying to use that to get energy. They're, they're desperate for energy. And uh, that's why cancer patients oftentimes just, they're just, they, they, they want more sugary things. It's the wrong thing to eat, but that's what they want because they need more energy because their cells are not using oxygen properly. So what we see is uh, in a healthy state, in the early stages of, of cancer, it's a low oxygen wound, the inj injury to the DNA persists, there's uh, an, uh, an oxidation signal that does not let up, and so all the cytokines that uh, we sometimes call uh, you know, the cancer markers, they are only there because the cell is trying to heal itself. It's a dysregulated inflammatory response. That's why the cancer oftentimes has an inflammatory microenvironment, which, by the way, IV vitamin C helps to change. So we see basically cancer is anaerobic cellular regression. It's regressing to a single cell behavior in a multicellular environment. It's trying to survive. It has evolved backwards. And unfortunately, if, if, it, it, if it establishes itself in that microenvironment of acidity and low oxygen and inflammation, it is gonna survive by virtue of the way that it is evolved. And so you've got to change the environment if you're gonna change the cellular functioning. And so this is why it's so great have Tim Gilbert here because you're going to be blown away by Tim's presentation on the role of glutathione in the initiation of cancer because he's talking about one of the key intracellular uh, antioxidants that regulates the health of the cell. And a lot of us have questions about how do we use glutathione properly with cancer patients, and I'm hoping he'll, he'll address that with, with us. So when you're giving large doses of vitamin C, you're generating the hydroxyl radical but you've got to give enough. So this is what happens. We know this is the redox cycling that gives rise to the production of hydrogen peroxide. This is why it's so interesting between the, the people who are using peroxide and ozone. In some ways, there's some interesting parallels here. I think vitamin C has it over them in the sense that vitamin C does some other things besides ozone, but it also does the same thing that ozone does, and I'll show you how that works. But anyway, we know from the National Institute of Health and Mark Levine's work that this really does happen. Peroxide is formed. You can document that now. And uh, then if you, through the Fenton reaction, you can convert that peroxide to the hydroxyl radical. And if you keep putting in enough vitamin C, you will generate more and more of the hydroxyl radical. And that's the pro-oxidant effect of vitamin C. And we're, we're using 25 gram IBCs as kind of a transition point, it could be different for different patients. 
So ideal redox therapy is by oxidant. Conventional cancer treatments kill by increasing oxidation and inducing apoptosis if you can, if the cells have not become resistant to apoptosis, um, which happens when the p53 gene can't work, as I showed you. So the ideal redox therapy would repair those control mechanisms, and a prooxidant effect would then cause the cells to go into apoptosis or possibly to even start to resume normal differentiation and functioning. And this all occurs because you restore the energy producing mechanisms of the cell. Now to do that, you, guys, you still have to have good nutrition, you have to get rid of the toxins in the environment, you have to uh, deal with all these secondary factors in order for the, for the cell to live in a healthy environment. And if you don't deal with these things, you're not gonna be able to sustain good oxygen utilization. Exercise is one of the best things you can do. There's very good work that people who exercise with cancer live longer. They're improving their oxygen utilization. So this uh, energy deficient theory of aging and degenerative disease, uh, this is basically what I've already showed you. This is why patients who come in, they're in adrenal fatigue, they're wasted, they're in acidosis, decreased oxygen utilization. Uh, we, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Berkson here today who's gonna be talking about alpha lipoic acid, who's one of the best ways to regenerate vitamin C and to regenerate glutathione, and alpha lipoic acid itself is a chelator and a blood sugar regulator, and it does all kinds of things that uh, is very helpful in caring for cancer patients. So it, it, it helps regenerate the intracellular antioxidant uh, faculties. So uh, I'm gonna go, try to go pretty fast here. Um, so these are what these guys are gonna be talking about. So I, high dose vitamin C corrects all this, shifts the cells back to aerobic through the hydroxyl radical. That's why I say IVC first. But ozone does it too, interestingly enough, and I think Dr. Schallenberger is gonna talk about that. Um, this question about when should we give glutathione, I'm gonna let, let that go for right now. We've already talked about this. Now, this is just my little contribution, and, I'm, and I'm, unfortunately I'm gonna have to kinda race through this, but I'd be happy to talk to anyone about it later, is that in order to convert uh, ADP to ATP, uh, you have to have uh, these complexes within the mitochondrial respiratory ch chain. A and, uh, and these can be, uh, this can happen by virtue of these uncoupling proteins. And there is one uncoupling protein, UPC3, that is regulated by T3. And so my interest at the Reardon Clinic has always been in thyroid thyroid care. And interestingly enough, T3 can increase oxygen utilization. Is this a potential link, link or a way to improve oxygen utilization in very seriously ill patients who are not in any position to start going out and doing a really aggressive exercise program? I think it might be. And so I think one of the first things I like to do with cancer patients is really look at their thyroid functioning and so uh, this is an interesting, interesting statement from Dr. Broda Barnes, who I'm sure most of you've heard of. Uh, he, he was working he, on thyroid at the same time Otto War, Warburg was looking at the respiratory defect in cancer. Broda Barnes said, if hypo, hypothyroid people don't die young from infectious diseases such as tuberculosis, they die a little later from cancer or heart disease. Hmm. And this is the typical cancer patient. When they come in, they have thyroid symptoms galore, these are some of the more common thyroid symptoms. This is a lecture that I gave. This lecture is online at Reardon Clinic, uh, and so I'm gonna have to rush through this, but this is my lecture about T3, reverse T3, that ratio. So we know how the gland is regulated by TSH, and we know a lot of people have normal TSHs, but they have a lot of the symptoms of low thyroid. And what we're seeing is that dysregulation of the thyroid can be a major cause of oxygen disutilization. So interestingly enough, molecular homeostasis, T3, T4, see the difference? The T4 molecule, you take off that lower left iodine, 
Now it's T3, and it's four times as strong. The reverse T3 is the right lower iodine, and it's zero activity. And most of your endocrinologists say it doesn't do anything. Heck, the body doesn't put something in there that doesn't do anything. Let's just, let's just get that straight, first of all. Reverse T3 is the regulator of the metabolic engine. It's the ratio of reverse T3 to free T3 that regulates the cellular metabolism. That's the bottom line that I'm going to get to. Reverse T3 has zero activity. T3 has an activity of one, and T4 is a, a quarter. So T3 is four times as active. Thyroid hormones are delivered to every cell in the body. This ratio can regulate oxygen utilization. So free T3 is a metabolic activator. It's like putting the throttle on your carburetor up, and reverse T3 is like a governor to keep it from going out of control. I mean, I always tell patients, how would you like to drive down the road with only an, uh, an ex the, uh, the accelerator uh, and no brake? So it's due to competitive inhibition that this is how free or reverse T3 regulates T3. Now, what's very interesting is that when you have environmental dysregulation, such as stress, infections, toxins, all the things that are the, what we're calling the root causes, that can downregulate the enzyme that converts T4 to T3, which is the 5 prime diiodinase. That's an epigenetic cause of dysregulation of oxygen utilization. And it very typically happens in the lives of everyone on the planet right now, because if you start looking at these dysregulators, you know, it used to be our ancestors, if they were starving, this made sense. You would downregulate the conversion of T4 to T3, and then the T4 would go down the other pathway. The sister enzyme would convert it in the direction of reverse T3, and that would slow your metabolic engine down, and that would help you conserve energy, which was good. That was a good thing to conserve energy, but, uh, now we've got all these very common dysregulators that we're constantly dealing with, 100% of the time. And uh, if you get a chance, take a look at this slide, because I think most of your patients who have cancer will have many, if not maybe most of these. And that's what gives rise to this kind of presentation of the chronically ill patient. So it's not only cancer, but diabetes, chronic fatigue, you name it, these go, these are there. And what we found is that there is a sweet spot in this ratio, and you can help patients get back to a ratio of about 18 to 21 to 1 of their free T3 to reverse T3. So you can directly me measure whether or not they're low, high, or right in where they should be. And this can help you manage their uh, cellular hypothyroidism and put them back into a state where they are having better oxygen utilization. It's not the only treatment, but it's a very nice early way to improve how they're feeling. And, and I, uh, I did this one discussion on pot belly to show how all these things so tightly interact. And so you really can't do just one thing. You really have to look at all the dysregulators and do the best you can in helping people begin to shift towards a more orchestrated wellness lifestyle. But these are things that you can begin to make changes in so we find that just even, even putting people on a low dose of even a half a grain of armor thyroid can begin to improve this ratio if they are low. Uh, obviously, you can work on the dysregulators, and that will improve the ratio as well. But I really think this is something that's worth looking at. We've started to study it. I've only been doing the reverse T3 for about a couple years now, and I didn't really make the connection with cancer until just recently. And I thought it fit in with what we're trying to do here in terms of uh, uh, helping people deal with the metabolic causes of, uh, you, you can see here, here's a patient that their reverse T3 is quite high. Uh, their ratio is uh, you know, quite low, maybe I'll show you here in just a second. And then we, uh, we, we gave them a little bit of T3 and it improved their, it, it actually helped them lower their C-reactive protein as well as improve their overall health. They went from a 6.8 to 1 ratio to a 13 to 1 ratio. The, the ideal would be 18 or 20, 21 to 1, something in that area. So thyroid energy can be a really helpful way. Now, my final comment, I'm going to end up here. 
How many of you have read the Da Vinci Code or uh, read the uh, Dan Brown novels where he always shows that the ancients put messages in their architecture? Dr. Reardon had this architecture of the Reardon Clinic as a dream. And I don't know if he meant it to be this way, but his idea was that he wanted the best of ancient science and ancient aspiration, the, the pyramid, to be on there to kind of let people know we're looking to the past, you know, these ancient traditions. Because when you look at ancient traditions of medicine, they're very holistic. They, they do treat all the underlying causes, the metabolic roots of illness. And then we have Buckminster Fuller's geodesic domes. And there's not just one dome there, there's eight. There's a central dome, which may be oxygen utilization, but all these surrounding domes represent the other metabolic root causes of chronic illness that have to be addressed. But we're addressing them with modern science. That's the beauty of this approach. We've got modern science now to validate the ancient therapies that were used to detoxify, to restore better diet, to clean the gut, to uh, uh, improve you know, meditation, relaxation, to help with stress. All these things that are now coming back in and patients want this as part of their healing. I think Dr. Reardon, in his dream, saw this as the medicine of the future and we're living it now. Thank you very much.